On a 1984 trip to Chama, New Mexico, one of more than 25 such trips, Bill stopped in the PBL shop and after some time emerged with three or four brass SN3 locos. As he says, they were a good price at the time. The serious building started with the Rico Yard in 1984, including the three-way switches, and then came a series of brass locos from the C-16s to the K-37s. Going back to the October 1969 Trains magazine and studying the William Modinger photos and the RGS story, all the large engines were retired and the focus became the Rio Grande Southern layout we'll see shortly. There have been many people working on the layout over the years who contributed to the building of this great model railroad. It is now in its 36th year. It's running well and will keep running as long as the old hogger keeps a good fire in the boiler. And the beer is always cold. I can personally vouch for that. So Grant uh, Knowles, who is uh, hosting uh, Bill's presentation, if you gentlemen can share your screen. Hello, everyone. And welcome to the Great White North Division of the Rio Grande Southern Railroad. Back in the beginning, I always called it the Great White North Division. And my good friend, the late Bud Nelson, took the Herald for the Rio Grande Southern, colorized it, and put the title around it. And it hangs proudly in the basement near the layout. So I modeled in the warm weather of 1940, the Rio Grande Southern. And the major reason for that is in 1940, there was still a lot of interesting cars on the layout. There was that large block of, of uh, CNS cars that came over in 1938. And the DNRG still had a bunch of 4,000 and 4,100 series boxcars in service, plus some of the uh, older gondolas in the 9,000, series. The layout runs with, we, re we use Railop to run the layout. Uh, the Railop program works quite well. Unfortunately, it's no longer available. And we are using the Lentz system. Now, Lentz was being developed at the time we were working on the layout. And uh, it's been working quite well ever since. We, uh, we have some newer stuff. We'll, we'll get into that later. I chose the section between Ridgeway and Rico up to Telluride as the area I wanted to model because I felt that was the most interesting. And in recent years, I've also managed to throw in the URA branch. That's a different story. So here's, here's Ridgeway with Telluride with uh, Trout Lake above it. And that old gas burner standing there, he's not as nimble as he used to be. And so what we have here is uh, basically there's four major sections of the railroad, all in all the same area. And try as I might, I could not spread them out. So. On the back wall, I have Ridgeway. Across the aisle, I have uh, Rico. Above that is Telluride. And above Ridgeway is the Trout Lake scene. And if you look down the hall, you'll see that wall across, which is actually the second du duck under. Underneath, on the other top of that is the Lizard Head Y. And we get a crowd in there. The aisles look big, but eh, they're not that big anymore. So let's just do a quick tour with number 40 and see what we can find. When I first started laying out the Ridgeway Yard, if you look at the prototype photograph, you can see where the depot is in relation to the engine house. But if I laid it out that way on the model, uh, the edge of the Ridgeway layout would be so wide that it would leave next to no room to get between Ridgeway and Rico. So I had to flip the engine house over around the 180 degrees, move the water tank closer to the depot. And if I didn't tell you that, you'd never know, but it does run. When Joe Foss first visited back in the beginning, he looked at my Ridgeway Depot and said, yeah, I don't like that. And, but he didn't like his own depot either. I think it had something to do with we both used the wrong set of drawings. So Joe built me a new depot and I thank you. It looks really good. And if you look above, you can see the lights and the uh, bench structure for Telluride above, uh, sorry, sorry, for Trout Lake above. And let's go down the road. 
And the Rio Grande Southern was in its last years. The state was going to build a highway underneath the trestle at uh, milepost uh, 160. And the question was, is the railroad going to continue to run? They said yes. And they built a steel structure to run the road under the trestle. I said, well, I got to have that on my layout. So Scott Leidenberger built this. And it turns out quite well. Underneath that is one of those buses that we used to be able to get. Can't get them anymore. I don't know what happened to the masters. Coming into Brown, well, Brown is Brown. There's not much going on there. We do stop for water. The water tank is one of six of the V&T shops tanks that I have on the left. Five belong to the RGS and the other one belongs to the DNRG. Coming into Placerville, or Pla uh, it's Placerville, but I call it Plasterville. The depot was built by Bill Meredith. Uh, this is a one by board by board thing. It's a really nice structure and really enhances the air. The grocery store is a well, HO building that Bill built, but it's not really HO. I didn't tell you that, did I? But it's again, it's another marvelous little building and it just fits right in with the scene. The overall Ridgeway, uh, sorry, overall Plasterville Yard, uh, again, you see the two, the building that uh, Bill built. The warehouses are built uh, on a base of mason, a base masonite structure, which I glued my homemade corrugated iron over and weathered it. The whole basic substructure is all sheet masonite. The buildings in the background were built using uh, drawings and that from the RGS story by, by Sundance. Uh, it became apparent that it was going to need some sort of staging area. So of course, these are an afterthought. This is the staging area at Durango. It's underneath Placerville. The one at Montrose at the other end, it's underneath Brown. Uh, they get rid of a lot of cars on the layout. One of the other fun things we have is uh, Greg Platt, one of the kids that worked on the layout many years ago, he built a Placerville Oak Outhouse Factory. Uh, he did the green go train car and he built a whole pile of outhouses. So I've got outhouses spread all over the land. If you need an outhouse, I'm sure I can get you one. Uh, Chris Lyon did this scene. Uh, this guy's panhandling and that section near uh, near Placerville, I started to make a water trough to feed the, uh, the the strainer, but unfortunately it was a little too big, so I've got to make that over again. This is a scene at Fall Creek. Uh, the coyotes were done by Phil LeBlanc, and uh, they they look like they've just had lunch and are going out for for a drink. The three pa passenger cars were the uh, Tamelco star model kits. Uh, they're a bit rough as far as kits go. They make great working car work cars, but I wouldn't want to use them on my prime passenger train. The V&T shops cars are much nicer. Uh, I had a rather large trestle here at one time, but I pulled it out because I didn't like it and put a smaller one in. And once you leave Fall Creek, we come to uh, Vanadium. This is how Vanadium was started many, many years ago. And as you can see, the basic structures are just blocks of masonite. Then I glued uh, wood scribe siding on them and painted them up from there. There's the, uh, the finished scene. Uh, the telegraph lines, hydro lines, and that are a thread product called Lycra. It was really nice. It sagged between the poles and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, it had a lifespan and uh, it all deteriorated and I had to replace it with Easy Line. There's a shot of myself working uh, Vanadium and that's Don Warziniak from Webster, New York in the back. Don's a regular visitor up here. Darn good modeler too. There's a prototype layout of, uh, of Vanadium. I'm not sure when this photograph was taken, but if you look at it carefully, you can see the general layout of my model. It simulates that pretty nicely. And for a while I had this guy working on the layout, but it's even a little too modern for me. So it's gone to the display case. The interesting thing is if you look at all the telegraph and hydro lines, that's Lycra. And after I got it all done, geez, I thought it'd be neat if it had an elevated steam line in it. So I went and I built in this elevated steam line working underneath all the wires and everything else. 
And I only broke two of them in the whole process. So that wasn't too bad a deal. With the uh, diesel gone, uh, the only rail master locomotive I have on the layout, 271, is now working that area. Carl Swale gave me the HO scale uh, engine house. Remember the old Revell line, the engine house, the bakery, and whatever they, they did? It makes a nice little building for the engine, for the engine storage. And on the other stall, I have a maintenance shop for the mine vehicles and all this other stuff. Leaving Vanadium, we come into this, uh, this small scene. This scene is actually in the wrong place on the layout, but you can't do much about that. Uh, it should be near uh, the stockyards at Plasterville. And of course, what's the popular beer in Colorado? Coors. I've got Coors signs all over the place. This is a really nice kit. This is the Rags Aladdin General Store from Wyoming. Well, I'm not modeling in Wyoming, but it was such a nice kit, I couldn't say no. So let's have a little fun with it. And I called it Dompener Lorry. And of course, Rags runs a gas station. And uh, considering I'm in Quebec, I can't call it a general store. I have to call it a Dompener. Okay. There's another shot of it. Really nice kit. Some other nice kits that I've got a hold of. There's uh, some of Banta's kits here and some of the Rags kits. This is a small town scene. I built up a Telluride just to fill in a place that I didn't know what the heck I wanted to do with. Coming into Vance Junction, we have the coaling pocket. This is another really nice structure done by, uh, by uh, Scott Leidenberger. He actually built two of them. The one I have here and the one I have at Rico. The uh, depot was built by Bill Meredith. And as you see, the scene is pretty close to the prototype. The passenger coach is an old V&T shop's body. The, I got the body and nothing else, so it went there. The other buildings were, uh, were all scratch built. Leaving there, we come up to uh, Wizard Head. Uh, this was a fun job. This, uh, the rail, Rail height here is five feet above the basement floor, and the whole structure had to be built in location. So I made some jigs to build the uh, the frames inside, and I get so many ahead, then I'd climb up on whatever I was standing on and glue them in place and start building in the structure. The structure is actually not glued in place because it actually comes out in three sections. Because I have a little problem that's called. My outside water tap is above it, as is the uh, as is the, uh, the vent net for the dryer. So I have to be able to move that when things don't work right. the uh, The plans for this came from the uh, January nineteen sixty three model railroad magazine. Uh, I was able to get plans, uh, drawings for the snow shed and the depot. The rest of the building's information was dug up in the RGS story by Sundance. There's another shot of it. This is, uh, this is just before we dick into the wall to get into pass the dry to the uh, central vac and uh, hot water tank. At Trout Lake, we have one of those famous water tanks. Uh, there's not much going on there. You stop and take water. Now and again, you'll see some maintenance away cars laying around. Then coming downhill, we go into Ofer. This was a, an interesting area to work. The, uh, you saw it in the opening scene. It's a rather large scene. And in order to get in there, I have a lift out in the middle of the layout. It takes three guys to take it out. One guy to push it up, which is usually me and two others just to move it out of the way. And looking at the buildings here, most of them are rags. The uh, depot is uh, the old PBL kit. And I think I scratch built the tram house, so I, I don't remember. But the whole backdrop is nothing but a bowl made out of sheet styrofoam. What I did is I took some one by twos and slid them into the layout. So they go down underneath the, underneath the yard and that. And then I cut and fitted in uh, sheets of styrofoam and then covered it all, uh, painted it all an earthy color and then covered it all with ground foam. 
I did do some plaster work in that around the, where the buildings are, but the rest of it is just scenery on styrofoam, which is really nice because then all you have to do is take an awl, punch a hole in the styrofoam and plant your tree. And that was done one Canada day back many years ago. I had all the buildings off of the, the area where the depot is. I had a piece of styrofoam there and I'm planting trees. The air conditioning was turned up as high as I could. And I was just baking, trying to put the trees in and not fall on the scenery and take it all down. So there we are coming out of Tellurize. There is a bit of rock work here. And I use, I use real earth. It gives me, I think, a better technique. This is the back of Ofer Loop. So the sheet styrofoam is hidden in behind all this area. And I just covered the whole thing with, uh, with some carpet that didn't have any backing. It just makes it look better and it's easier to maintain. Coming out of Ofer Loop, we're on bridge 44A, we're with 46D in the background. And we come in to Rico. Sorry, yeah, I'm in Dorico. Here we are in Dorico. And this is the Banta Propatria Mill Kit. Now, the first two buildings in the foreground were not part of the kit, but there were excellent drawings of that in the RGS story. So, well, of course, I have to have those buildings. So, again, the usual technique. Uh, actually, I use plywood for this. <coughs> But this is uh, the Banta kit, absolutely stunning kit. The biggest and most expensive laser cut kit I ever built, but it went together quite well. In the foreground, you'll see Banta's uh, coal storage building. And there's all kinds of other fun stuff around here. There's the model compared to the real McCoy. It's not bad, looks pretty good. And then coming into Rico, uh, I don't think Rico's ever been this busy. I've got nine engines in the engine house and all kinds of other kits and that. And everything, everything that's here is based on what you'd see in, uh, in Rico. Near the edge of the layout, we've had to put a plastic edge up to uh, protect the scenery and the buildings and that from uh, the guys that exceed plate C. And here's the depot. It was built by Grant Knowles from the uh, October 1962 model railroad. Turned out to be a really nice kit. The rest of the buildings are all, I think it's bad as uh, Rico set. Not sure about that. And, oh, there's something there. There's a mystery car. I like putting mystery cars on the layout. And there it is. Rio Grande had a, a block of standard gauge box cars in bakery service. And they call them cookie cars, cookie boxes. Well, heavens, I gotta have one in my layup simply to crank people and it does that, it's good fun. And there's Rico and model and prototype. I think I have more cars than they do. And now that's the end of the tour. Let's go looking at some other things. As I said, I've been working with Lentz right from the beginning. Uh, when we first started, uh, we looked at other things. Uh, David Steer is the uh, master electrical engineer here. And at the time, Lentz was the best thing going. And so we kept going with Lentz and now they've got their new radio control units out. So I built a storage unit to keep the radio control unit separate from the uh, plugins where they're stashed in another drawer. Another thing we did when building is the supports for the run, front of the layout go down at an angle to the base of the, of the wall. That keeps the, the, the legs out of the way so you don't kick them when you're working on the layout or whatever else you're doing. Another handy thing was to put the control panels on sliding panels. So when you're working Ridgeway, you pull the panel out that you want to work, do your work, then you can push it out of the way and you don't walk into it. Another thing we've done is recess the controls for the various yards. This is the one end of the, of the Rico yard and it's actually mounted in the side of the Telluride yard. So it's up high enough so you can uh, see what you're doing. And there's the modernized RGS trestle 
46D. More coming on that. And there's 44A just coming out of uh, the wrinkle. And there's the old 46D. When I was building this, there are six trestles from milepost 46. Of course, I wanted all of them. Lots of luck, guy. I got to 46D. And then the only way to do it was to make it about 100 feet shorter so I could get 46E in. Well, 46E never looked right from the very beginning. So back about 2016, I finally said, enough is enough. It's amazing what you can do with a little C4. And I blew that whole section of the layout out and started the rebuild. 46D went to the shop and I had uh, an old trestle that I broke up. So I used parts of that trestle to lay out the new 46D. And there you see it's being, as you, being put together on the desk. I've put uh, a straight edge along it to keep it straight and weights on it so it wouldn't fall over and just kept building the trestle. And uh, it's finished. Uh, not quite ready for rail. The only way I could do the rail was to take it down on the layout and set it in place. Well, I'd have support to put the rail on. And I also did a little bit better job of supporting it this time. So I built shelves of plywood underneath it. And there's the main lower level. And then there's another level to get the shorter legs. And then uh, and went on from there. So you can see the various steps in supporting the trestle. That just means I have shorter legs under the, under the really short uh, section of the trestle. In order to do the scenery in this area, I had to remove the trestle, do the scenery in the background, plant the trees and so on. And it's the standard, you know, chicken wire and, uh, and plaster trick, the, the old thing we've used for years. And in the foreground, I'm starting to lay out the butterfly mill, which was one of the principal reasons why I started doing this. So there's 44A and 46D and not much around it yet. There's my early thinking on the uh, on the butterfly mill. Uh, it didn't fly for very long. Another shot of it. There's my second thinking. Uh, getting to what I wanted. Not not yet though. And that's what I finally came up with. The uh, the mill hides a very unpleasant section of the transition from the high line over the uh, over the aisle leading into. Uh, Trout Lake and the uh, the Wyatt Lizard at uh, Telluride Bandora. The building is basically a big box built with out of sheet uh, plywood with uh, scribe siding on the sides and that. And uh, and let's see what's there. There's two Banta kits there: the boiler house and the and the tool shed. They're out of the Ridgeway engine yard detail. Here's a closer of it. I asked uh, Joe Foss to cut me some uh, longer stairs uh, so that I could get these stairs on the outside. Most of his stair kits are too short. So he cut me these things that are about nine inches long and they turned out quite well. This is the uh, Bar Mills uh, hotel kit. This was a test shot that I got from Joe Foss. I managed to get it before he threw it in the fireplace. And I modified it a bit, cut off some things I didn't like, changed the chimneys around. And that's the bunkhouse for the mill. The boxcar in the foreground is uh, one of two uh, Don Heinberger's kits, uh, Scenery Unlimited. They were close to uh, the, the DNRG cars in the 2611 to 2645 series. So I thought they'd make good storage cars uh, for the, the mill and the hotel. There's an overall of the uh, of the mill with Ridgeway in the background, uh, Pandora up on the top right with the tracks below leading to Brown. And uh, oh, man, there's the uh, uh, Dompreneur Lorry in the background. When we got to uh, doing Pandora, I really had no idea what I wanted to do there. And I had so many other things on the go. Bill Merrith has stepped up and said, uh, got some ideas. I said, fine, go for it. And this is what came up. There's the Smuggler Union mine. There's the Red Mill. Again, it's 
built on a masonite uh, base with this time uh, evergreen styrene on the uh, to give you the board finish on that. And that's what it looked like when it was finished. So you've got the red mill in the background, you've got Tomboy in the foreground, and a whole lot of war box cars. And there's what it looks like in real life. The uh, Pandora is, as I say, it's about five and a half feet above the floor. And we, we've had to build a, a platform for the operator to work on so he doesn't have to kick around these little step stools. That's uh, Peter Jackson. He's the principal yard master. They're a grumpy guy, you know, he's really hard on the ore trains when they come in. And Bill also gave me some other buildings and I've played around with the town here at Pandora. I've got some of the buildings lettered that. Uh, there's one of those buses again. The little vehicle in the foreground is that RGS uh, bus truck that they ran around. There was three of those built or three kits made. I have one, Don Rosiniak has the other and uh, uh, Sam Farakawa has the third one. There's Schultz AG. Again, that's one of Bill's kits. I just added a bunch of detail. That's the actual Texaco dealer up here. This area is underneath Wolfer Loop. Originally, this area was just going to run, disappear under the layout and come out in, uh, on the other side and run into staging. But when I looked at it, I said, you know, this would make a really nice scene. So you've got the RGS stock yard, stockyard on the main line. You've got uh, some some buildings of some sort that I'd put in the background and there's a bunch of horses and that. The uh, livestock and that was all painted by Chris Lyon. And this is another one of those buildings that the railroad built when they were building it. Uh, it just makes a neat little little thing. And this is just before you pop off the uh, layout into uh, Durango staging. The story goes back when RGS had a switch crew at Telluride, the guys used the Boxcar 01772 as their cozy caboose. They apparently bolted a couple of station uh, benches to the roof and they're working on working with that. And I'm thinking to myself, Telluride, Pandora at that altitude in the winter? I don't think so. So I looked at what uh, Santa Fe and uh, Chicago, Burlington, Quincy did with the four wooden caboose. And I said, okay, let's have fun. So I took one of TSM's 4,000 series boxcars and that's what happened to it. Detailed inside, probably too many doors, probably too many steps, but it looks neat. It serves uh, the switching at Telluride Pandora. And it also takes the empties down to uh, Vance Junction and brings up the loads for for the Telluride operation. Back sometime in 1945, I think it is, the Alamosa shops did some work on Caboose 0577. This is the PBL kit. But when it came out of the shops, it had been mislettered. They had lettered at Denver and Western Rio Grande instead of Rio Grande Western. I can't say whether the other side was done, but this was good enough for me. I just had to have it on the layout. It's hidden somewhere. There's uh, the Rag Zofra Ure Depot kit, and there's the real one. Uh, that's another story. And during the height of the pandemic, when uh, we could not get together, that's when I started working on the Pro Patch on the uh, Butterfly Mill and bunch of other projects. So I had stuff all over the place. The, the workhorse was out and I had senior material here and junk all over the place. Fortunately, I didn't have to stop uh, stop every two weeks clean up, uh, clean up so we could run trains again. But I got a lot of work done. And that's it, guys. We've been around the layout. Yep. Um so a, a, a question from Reiner. He says, I enjoy the depth of the Ofer and Patria mine scenes. How did you do that? For Patria, I forgot to mention that. Uh, when, uh, when I started building uh, uh, Rico and Telluride and uh, 
the Ofer lines, I put another wall in the center of the back half of the basement. So on the one side, you've got the Ofer High Line and the Loop and all this other stuff and uh, Butterfly and uh, butterfly Mill. On the other side, you've got Rico on the lower level and Telluride on the upper level. But as that wall is not a bearing wall, I cut a chunk of it out and push the scenery, uh, the backdrop, but right to the back of the scenery behind it and then was able to fit the uh, the Propatria mill in. So it's it's actually sitting in the wall, hmm. partially, and then coming out from the front. So I have tracks to uh, service the loading in that. Yeah, that must add to the depth. That's good. Yeah. Now, that was the only way I could do it. Otherwise, it wouldn't fit. And it, was and suggested you... I, it was suggested I move it somewhere else. No, but it had to go one place and one place, uh, and that was Rico. Yeah, yeah. Before you did, before you cut the hole in that wall, did you actually know it was not weight bearing? <laughs> Oh, I, yeah, because I built the wall. <laughs> oh, I good. Built the wall. <laughs> Just no, no, check the wall, was, the wall was built uh, between the center of the basement and the back wall. So right, it's right. Not a, it's not a bearing wall. Um, Dave Woodhead is asking, what was the Caboose 1772? But I think he put that question in before you explain what Caboose 1772 was. So. Yeah, it was, it was just something I had fun Having with some it. fun with it, right? Yeah. Um, Larry McDonald uh, up here in Toronto is asking, can you say something about your backdrops? Uh, the early backdrops were built, were painted by uh, Greg Platt, and the newest ones were all painted by Chris Lyon. And Chris Lyon has paint drop, backdrops painted all over Ottawa. He's got, I think he's repainted most of Tommy Hood's layout, and he's repainted, I don't know who else's layouts. He's a very skilled and talented uh, artist. He's also a good videographer, because he shot lots of videos on my layout and the other layouts in uh, in Ottawa. In fact, if you want to see the layout running, just go to YouTube and punch in C N L V N, and his site will come up. And there's, uh, I think, 50 odd videos of my layout and a whole bunch of other great model railroad videos and some other stuff. And if you can't remember that, just go to your search engine, punch in Bill Scoby model railroad, and guess what's going to show up? All That's great. You must it. have. Uh... Uh, you must have been sneaking a look at the ch chat because uh, somebody's asking, uh, what's, the, what's the YouTube link? So now we know that. Yeah, <laughs> That's uh, Scott's question. Yeah, C-N-L-V-N. All right. Ah, so Dave Woodhead says, ah, there's 1772. Uh, Scott is saying, thanks, Bill. Great looking layout and nice hand painted backdrops. Uh, Mark Evans, really nice layout, Bill. Thank you for sharing. Jim Brown, thanks, Bill. Enjoyed your presentation, as well as our visit a couple of years ago with Bill Meredith. Uh, Phil Taylor has posted the link to the YouTube. Uh, great layout, Bill, from Alan. Uh, Alan Br Brickoff, uh, thanks for sharing with us. Uh, Phil Taylor. Um, oh, that'll link to a long playlist. So you might need to uh, do a search on YouTube to find that, uh, find the correct link. Uh, Ian McKinley says, thank you for the presentation. And Bill Hobbs says, thanks for the tour. Um, does anyone else have any questions for Bill? Well, I, I don't, uh, David Woodhead here. Hi, Bill. Um, I just want to say thanks for really getting me started on a, in narrow gauge, like about 19... 70 or 72 or something you and Dave Steer and I have something I have something for you I don't know if you yeah there it is whoops oh no it's, it's being cut <laughs> off it is an HON3 kind of take off on a chili line car that you did uh, using some AHM plastic this is this is ancient history I know maybe it's embarrassing are you trying <laughs> to tell me I'm old or something <laughs> <laughs> nice yeah anyway uh, so uh, I remember on, on uh, Tom Hood's layout, you and Dave Steer had a bit of HO and three on uh, dual gauge, and that was one of the things that that was really influential on me. Thank you. Yeah, and all yeah. that all that stuff on Tommy's layout is gone. The whole I bet. has been redesigned. It's uh, and it's still running strong. Oh yeah, great. <laughs> you figure the main part of Tommy's layout is over fifty years old now. Oh my God. Yep. That's amazing. I got a visit. Oh, I'll be in Ottawa. Uh, maybe I can call him up. I don't know. Is it still, is it still Tuesday nights? Yeah, it's still Tuesday nights. Still? <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're all at Ovar tonight, but they're, I'm here okay. having fun. Yeah, that sounds great. 
Uh, right. Doug, Doug Junda has a comment. He uh, says, um, um, uh, Bill was great, much beeping in person. Kathy would like to know where the Champagne Express is. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just have cold beer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, if there's no other questions, um, thanks a lot, Bill. I uh, really appreciate you. And particularly, I want to um, uh, give a tap of the hat to uh, Grant Knowles, who, uh, who is hosting uh, this presentation and made this all possible. Uh, put together the slides for Bill and uh, did a great job. So thanks, Grant. And thanks, Bill.